Good evening. Good evening, everyone. This is Megan um, from uh, Planning and Development. Can you all hear me? Hey, Megan, we can hear you. Um, I can hear you on my computer, but we need to test on the, the room, too. Oh, great. Are you in person, right? I am. I am. Okay, very good. Are you in person? Yeah, I am. Hi Jeff, I can um, I can see you, but I, I can't hear you. I see your mouth moving. I don't know if you're trying to test out the equipment. Bree, if you can hear me, I, I can't hear the sound in the room. I can see you. Um, I think uh, Jeff has set up his computer to face you in the screen, but I I cannot hear. I don't know if others, Poonam or, or Commissioner Spain, if you all can hear. But I'm not able to hear anything, any of the sounds in the room. Megan, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't hear anything uh, yet either. Great. All right, I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> With that in mind, oh, they, yeah, look, we have got, uh, they, they also are having a hard time hearing. And of course, you see, I'm speaking here. I should be speaking here because then they can hear me. Yeah, Megan, Megan, are you are you all able to hear? Hello? Yes, I think I think we must be hearing you, Brie, from your computer. So yes, yes that's it. Yeah. I'm turning off that speaker because otherwise you'd hear both of us, and you would just hear the echo. So in the future, we'll just use yours and remind me that if I speak from there, I'm doing remotely. I should be speaking here. Okay, 
Because otherwise, we and found that you have echoes from two different videos. Does that know? And it might it may be helpful um, during the Q and A, Bree or or Jeff, if you wouldn't mind repeating the questions from the audience, so that uh, we can hear hear them. It's just a little muffled. Okay, do you hear a little better now? Um, I we can I can hear you perfectly. I just can't. I, now Jeff sounds like he's away from the microphone, yes, and I have a feeling true. when the questions are raised from the yes. audience, it'll it'll be very difficult for us to hear. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So if you could just repeat them, that'd be helpful. Will do. Yeah. That's a five text, right? Yourself. For this. Okay. Right. Otherwise, it's going to pick up. So, Graham, are you? Graham, I, I think you, I think you asked me asked if I I could hear you, and the answer was yes, but very. Very, very, it was very quiet. Probably still from my computer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll begin then. <laughs> okay, so my name is Brian Fuller. Oh gosh, there's a an echo. Yeah, that's not good. Okay. Okay. Old system. Old system's back in place. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, hopefully that is the case. Okay, please let me know if I need to speak up at all too. I tend to talk softly and it is not my intention. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, so my name is Brianne Fuller. I'm with Housing and Community Development. Um, I focus on preservation um, within housing. I am also accompanied by Graham Owen and Megan Van Dam with Planning and Development. Is that that they can't hear me? Okay, okay I'll go ahead. So we are, I'm here to discuss a um, comprehensive plan amendment that we are working on for affordable housing preservation. Slides aren't moving, there we go. Okay, so just for a little bit of background, um, in July, 2020, the board established the affordable housing preservation task force to develop strategies to prefer, um, preserve affordable housing in Fairfax County. The task force met from October, 2020 to February, 2021, and developed a set of strategies to preserve the existing stock of affordable housing. Um, these included financial tools, land use policies, and legislative legislative priorities. Um, and then in April, 2021, the board both endorsed the task force um, endorsed, endorsed the task force recommendations and authorized a comprehensive plan amendment for affordable housing preservation. So the preservation task force task force was tasked specifically with preserving two types of um, affordable housing in the county. The first is market affordable properties, which are do have naturally occurring um, affordability, uh, so that they would be affordable to households earning sixty percent of the area median income or below. Um, as well as committed affordable units whose um, affordability is um, does have income restrictions, um, affordable at 80% of the area median income and below. These might be committed through the ADUWDU program. Um, they might have utilized tax credits or are otherwise privately owned, but do have those income restrictions, unlike the market affordable properties. So those are the um, categories of affordable housing that the um, 
amendment takes into consideration. So, as you all know, the comprehensive plan is a guide that reflects the community's long term land use vision for the future. Amendments include extension extensive community engagement um, and the preservation task force recommendations had multiple recommendations um, in, in them it's pertaining to a comprehensive plan amendment. So this was a high priority task. So we are looking to amend the policy plan within the comprehensive plan. Um, this does include 11 functional elements, each, each with um, goals and objectives and or objectives, policies and um, guidelines to guide planning and development review. And um, the current housing element that we have has five objectives and policies to accompany them. Um, the objectives mainly pertain to the production of new affordable housing. So staff um, utilized a list of market affordable properties that HCD had compiled in order to um, look at the types of properties that we might see come in for redevelopment. As vacant land becomes increasingly scarce in Fairfax County, these properties become more and more vulnerable to redevelopment as they age. Um, looking at these different properties helped give us an idea of what we might see coming in for redevelopment. Um, most of these properties are built before 1970 and they're primarily low rise garden style apartments. So while we were thinking about how to make preservation more viable, um, we looked at how additional density may be applied to these properties um, so that we could, the ones that we could potentially see redevelop in the future. Um, this led to a couple different methodologies um, that we tried out for a set density bonus, kind of like you would you see with the WDU policy. Um, this, that included one market rate unit for every affordable unit preserved and then different um, sets of uh, percentages and ratios of density that could be applied for different levels of preservation that would have occurred. Um, so each site though is just so unique that for every um, methodology that worked out for one property, it didn't work out for a whole host of other properties. Um, so we, um, the density, yeah. So some sites may have small acreages that might not accommodate additional density um, or the neighborhood may be low rise um, residential neighborhood. It might not fit the, fit the um, the density might not fit the context of the area. So we did determine that we needed a context sensitive approach to the density incentives. Using a bunch of different means here. So the draft text seeks one for one replacement of existing affordable units that are being redeveloped um, in order to further the board's objective of no net loss of affordable housing. Um, the text allows for potential additional density above plan guidance without a comprehensive plan amendment um, where certain conditions are met S and gives staff the ability to take each site into consideration separately as they come in. Um, so an affordability analysis will be conducted by HCD with each zoning case and plan amendment to determine if any existing affordable units are going to be affected by redevelopment. And overall, this adds to the county's housing preservation and development tools. Um, and it solidifies one for one replacement as a countywide policy. Um, this, this kind of language can be found in some parts of the county, but we were hoping to make it countywide. So structurally, we are looking to add a sixth objective um, to, the, to the policy plan with accompanying policies, as well as a second appendix that includes guidance for that additional density. Um, and we are also amending the glossary to include definitions of market and committed affordable housing. We published the draft text in September and we are we are um, currently conducting outreach. I will say that we um, we did extend the timeline a bit. Um, so we were looking at um, a planning commission public hearing in February 2023 and a board of supervisors public hearing in March 2023. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Oh, that's true. Yeah, my, my computer's the provides the sound. Let me put my laptop up here so that you can talk near it. Can you can you all hear me, Jim? Okay. Uh, my question was that in the past, if they uh, proper affordable housing over and above what was uh, in the comprehensive plan, they could get a bonus of up to 20%. Is that still in effect? Yes, um, they, these density bonuses would be available on top of those if it is a situation where they are exceeding the amount of ADUs or WDUs that would have otherwise been required. 
second question was, did they do that? Did they take I, into sorry, I, this is Megan. Can I just add in? But the, I think just to clarify, um, with this amendment, you could exceed the 20% bonus. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you can. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. So there's no cap on that bonus. Yes. But so we, um, the, we can exceed the 20% bonus if the ADUs and WDUs, um, if that requirement is lower than the preservation that would be done. Now, when you add the 20%, you adjust the transportation proffers and the school proffers for the additional units. Yeah. So we, we, um, need to make sure that all the other um, uh, things are mit mitigated with the with the zoning case. The addition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Thank you. Thank you, John. Are there any other questions? Go on, please. Well, Q. <laughs> Ryan's place, alphabetically. <clears throat> Uh, so the goal is to maintain the number of affordable units. Yes. Yeah. So when a developer redevelops an affordable unit, how is another affordable unit created? What is what what happens? What is like the, the mechanism by which yes, it becomes yes. affordable? Yeah. So. In the case of the market affordable properties, um, we would be looking for those to become committed affordable units that we can ensure that that affordability is is there. Um, so what would be naturally occurring before it's redeveloped, it's just, just the, the rent is low because that's what the market, that's what it gets on the market. We would be looking for them to be committed to a certain um, AMI level, affordability level. So they are limited to what they can when they redevelop, they are limited to to the the rent they can. They can yes, help. yeah, in a sense, that's yeah, that's what happens with committed units. But we are okay. offering those additional market rate units above what they would normally be able to get to kind of help balance things out a bit. Thank you. Okay. I'll preface this by saying I think there's a couple of terms that you may be using that are a little misleading. You use the word preservation. Could you define what preservation is? Well, in this sense, we like, like you said, we are, we're trying not to lose any affordable units. We're trying to preserve them. I mean, we're not, this isn't physical preservation. This would be used preservation in that we are preserving the fact that they are affordable units. So it's not physically preserving the building because they would be redeveloped. But physical preservation is something that is also um, dealt with in the task force recommendations that we do have other mechanisms for. Could you define redevelopment? Someone comes and tears down a market rate or a, a building that has market rate units that, um, and they build something different and that otherwise wouldn't have those affordable units in them. And how did you define development? I'm not sure. How, um, new development. Something that was not there before. So does this limit new development or is this encouraging new development? Well, we're hoping it encourages new development. We just want to ensure that people can remain in their homes and their communities and they're not kicked, you know, kicked out. So if there's a vacant piece of land, the developer wants to put in housing that could be developed with affordable units. Well, it always be developed. Yeah, I mean, it, it could, but in this sense, that wouldn't be preservation because there wouldn't be, that there would weren't be new development. Yeah, there weren't existing units on site. So if an individual has a unit that we would call a teardown, single family dwelling, how many units can they put on that piece of property? So this, this only pertains to um, multifamily buildings with four or more units. So I probably should have specified that, um, but this, this wouldn't apply to this, anything like a single family home. Being okay, I'll down. use your example. Okay. You have a building that has four units in it. Yeah. They're gonna redevelop that. How many units can they build? That's that's part of why this is kind of a flexible approach because there, there are a lot of things that would go into determining how many units. Like what would be determining? Where, where it is, the transportation, um, what it says in the comp plan currently, what they're hoping to rezone to. I mean, there, there, are kind of, there are a lot of factors that go into how many units can be built on a site. So theoretically, you could take a piece of property that has four units triple it to put 12. I guess theoretically, depending on where it is, I mean, I, it, I think it de depends on a lot of 
pretty typical zoning factors. And I might add as well, um, this is Megan Van Dam from Planning and Development. Yeah, the, the rezoning process is, is very complex in that we have to go through an evaluation, not just about can they preserve the units, but also are they meeting other comprehensive plan objectives related to compatibility with the surrounding uses? Does it fit into the established character of the area? You know, are there ways to take, in your example, with the, the new 12 unit building, are there ways, you know, if, there, if it is in a, uh, if it is in a more dense area, uh, does it, you know, how does it compare relative to the, the you know, density around it? If it's not, does it make sense to put it in there? Is there a way to buffer and transition to make it work? And if not, then it wouldn't be supported. If there, you know, that we, and it would go through the typical process where there's a review, the staff report, this, the zoning evaluation division provide, puts together a staff report, goes through, looks at the relationship to the plan objectives, um, looks at impact mitigation, uh, and presents that uh, recommendation to the planning commission and the board at a public hearing. And there are opportunities as well for the community to review that as well. So it's not, it's, I, I hear you on this, it's in the hypothetical four units could go, could triple to 12, but there are some, there are, you know, other mitigating factors and other plan objectives that would ha would still have to be met um, with, uh, with, with this policy. And, and we'll have to look very critically at that because as you know, as you all know, anytime there's a density increase, it's, um, you know, it, it can be very uh, detrimental to um, established neighborhoods. So we, you know, the county would have to look um, very closely at whether or not it makes sense. How many units do you have currently on the list? What, what, how many units what? How many units fall into this category do we have in Fairfax County today? Oh, for market affordable, there's about um, 8,500, 8, 9,000. Um, of them, and then I don't know how many committed affordable units there are. I think there's, well, there are, we do have a dashboard, affordable, affordable housing dashboard that does have that information. I can absolutely provide a link to that, but it, it shows our numbers of market. And how many more do you think we need? Well, for preservation, we're trying not to lose any. That's not answering the question. How many more do you think you need? I'm not sure I'm not in production. I'm only in preservation. So that would be, that would be a general question I can. Ask, but I think, oh, we have, I, we do, we have a production goal. Yeah, that's true. Well, and I think, I think the goal of this, the work is, is to preserve all of those 8,500 units in some form or fashion. Yeah, but there, there's a goal within Fairfax County to create more. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in knowing how many more you're trying to create because some of the things that came out in ZMOD would indicate that we would try to put additional housing units on property that was originally built for just two or for one family. Whether they'd be mm -hmm. affordable, that's debatable. But if you're going to do that with regular housing, why can't it be done? Why would it not be done with affordable housing? Well, I think, are you, are you referring to the accessory dwelling unit um, issues? Yes. I mean, they, with this, we're not talking about redeveloping single family homes. Uh, we're not talking. We're not talking about that. Um, this is only for mul existing multifamily buildings. So presumably, many of those multifamily buildings, the majority of them, are already within development centers and activity centers or nearby. So we're not talking about uh, consolidating or um, changing the format of uh, neighborhoods that contain single-family homes right. with this policy. All right, thank you. Yep. Could you elaborate on what Megan said? Because some of us in the back. Okay. Yeah, Megan, Megan was talking about um, how we're looking to preserve existing multifamily properties. And as I mentioned, it's four or more, we're looking at buildings with four or more units. So um, she mentioned that a lot of them are in. Um, in higher or denser areas already. So we're not looking to um, change the layout of existing um, residential neighborhoods that have single family homes and consolidate those parcels for affordable housing. It's, it's just, it's essentially preserving multifamily that's already there. And so what you're saying is that 
If you have open family, you don't want to use that open family means. But you're not, this is not a category of adding new multiple family house. That's a different thing. Yeah, production and preservation are different. So if if something has you know 20 affordable units right now, we would want 20 affordable units. Um, but there there is a potential to get additional market rate density associated with that to kind of assist with the you know the viability of those units. So um, there is that, but it's not it's not we're not talking about single family homes. Yeah, uh, short short comment and then then a two part question. Yeah. I guess the comment is that the issue of affordable housing is not just restricted to the DC metropolitan area, something all over the country, in various size locations. Uh, following up on that, I guess a general question is what other examples of relevant type communities, basically fairly well developed suburban counties, were assessed for what they are doing. How successful have they been in achieving these same goals you've identified? That's question one. Question two is I've heard different people over the years say that if you want a good example of very diversified housing, look at the Reston area where you have everything you can think of. And I know that that when my wife and I first moved here, that's where we lived for a while. And you have a very diverse range of apartments and townhomes, single family homes, size, price range, all over the place. Uh, is something like that envisioned as kind of the concept you're seeking to achieve in other parts of the county? Um, I'm going to start with the second part. So, in this, in for this amendment, we were just looking to preserve those multifamily units. But I hear what you're saying about Reston. I mean, there's a, definitely been a mixture of different housing types that are affordable to different affordability levels. Um, I would say even units in Reston are becoming too unaffordable for people whose wages are stagnant. Um, but but I, I hear what you're saying about a diversity of, of um, housing types, which can certainly assist in affordability overall. Um, about the first part, I do want to, I just want, do you want to, I don't want to put you on the spot, Graham, but since you were um, involved in the task force, I thought I read that they looked at other jurisdictions. Um, <laughs> yeah. Around the <laughs> now, I'll just mention that we, we did have a task force effort that looked at this issue um, over the course of about four to six months. And as a part of that, we had stakeholders both from Fairfax as well as from surrounding jurisdictions, including those that do um, affordable housing for a living, you know, in terms of either the development side, uh, working in the, you know, the services um, that, that afford affordable housing is often associated with. So we had a lot of stakeholders. They, there were also representatives, or people that worked in other states, so Montgomery County, for example, um, who were a part of the initiative and helped us come up with um, the recommendations, not in a formal capacity, but in an advisory capacity. So we looked at, you know, what Arlington's doing, Alexandria, Montgomery County, um, but this this particular approach was developed as a result of you know, a collaborative effort that was initiated by the state the task force that you know, initiated this and came up with recommendations so, okay. in April right. of last year. Yeah. And then I guess kind of one one kind of short follow up, and then I'll sit down with someone else speak if they want to. Uh, most of your discussion been talking about multifamily mm -hmm. developments, yeah. and I'm thinking to myself, there are still not as many as there once were, but there are still some single family affordable housing areas in the county. Mm -hmm. There's one not too far north of here, off of Route 50, manufactured housing on the south side of Route 50 to the west of Route 28. Is the county also committed to the preservation of those types of developments? Number one, would they be willing to consider additional developments of that type? Question number two. Um, so for question number one, we actually are starting work on a manufactured housing comprehensive plan amendment as well. Um, it's it's a very um, it's 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 a very unique manufactured housing has very unique challenges. So we are looking at that separately than this preservation. But um, there was a there was also a manufactured housing task force um, that that looked at um, that had recommendations similar to preservation task force in that they they resulted in um, different um, actions for staff to take to help. Um, 
preserve those manufactured housing units or preserve affordability. Um, so, so there is an effort underway on that and that plan amendment was authorized in October. So we are getting started on that. And I guess in my follow up before I go sit down as well, hopefully these two groups are collaborating with each other because you can't have one without the other. Agreed. Yeah, yeah. And the, the manufactured housing task force was born out of the preservation task force, I believe, because it came after there were some manufactured housing um, recommendations within the preservation task force. Um, but then there was just a separate effort because as I mentioned, it's um, it's it's very unique situation. Um, so those those all we, we do talk to each other. Those those people are basically me. So <laughs> and and the people who um, in DPD who worked on both. Like Graham and, and Megan. So, um, yes, they're absolutely. Well, I would, I, in sync. <laughs> I would suggest you be careful with the term unique. Yes. Because manufactured housing, some parts of the entire country, is a very regularly employed method of housing. Development. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I didn't, I, I just meant in the sense that um, for preservation, we're looking at um, strictly rentals. And for manufactured housing, they own their homes and then rent the land. So, there's a, typically, so there's, Okay, there's that, a bit that, of a, that, that's a nuance. Yeah, 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 we'll yeah. Get it, we'll get yeah. It out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I one, appreciate it. One more thing I would say on manufactured housing. That mobile home. We'll be looking at the same way. In some instances, the plan says that it should remain. In some, today, the current comp plan says that it could be redeveloped in line with development. So that discussion that you're getting at will be front and center. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I have a question myself. Yes. Uh, in certain parts of other cities, there were brownstones built at the turn of the last century. I should say the last century. Two centuries ago, <laughs> they were large single family residences. And when times got tough and the neighborhood changed, they were let out room by room, made into apartments. Now investors are coming in and buying them and buying out the individual renters and consolidating it and then modernizing it so it's back to its original use, which was a single family house. But that now house may go for let's say in parts of Brooklyn and Manhattan in the 20 or $30 million range, because it's got good bones. So I don't think we in Northern Virginia have that, but we might, there might be houses that have good bones that were subletted and somebody's interested in creating an individual family home out of it now. How would that happen? How would, what would we do in this case now? So this doesn't pertain to single family homes. But it's not, it was, a multiple family house. There were 15 people living and five people per floor, three stories or four stories, lots of people renting rooms or apartments in this good boned house. And now that a person with sizable equity buys the lot and proceeds to remove their renters to remake it back into it. So for the last hundred years, it wasn't a single family house. It was a multifamily resident. That used to be a single family house. Gotcha. And if somebody wishes to revert back to its original use, where does that fall into this? I think it would fall into this if those um, units in that building are actual units with their own, you know, kitchen, they're considered their own. I mean, we're not talking about the, this doesn't include the room rentals um, or something that might have four rooms rented out that wouldn't count as units in this case. Um, but if they were different units, if it, if it were, you know, uh, a, a, a structure that has four units, it, it would fall under here. No, no, again, I don't know whether that exists. I yeah, yeah. Is. Yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it has to be rezoned and such. Okay. Are there other questions? Now, with this in mind, Greg? Yes. Greg, are you coming back for us? Is this going to be? To us, will we have this proposal? This is a draft now, or is this a final thing? It's it's currently in draft format. So it's draft. So do we expect you to come back sometime in the next year and say this is what we have planned? If you would like, yeah. We would that definitely would like that. Great. And 
last week we heard about the prioritization. What, what was did we? What was the subject we heard yesterday? Last week on last Wednesday, was it a oh it, public housing? No, not was it public. public facilities? And it was one of those things that you had at the beginning of this slide, a slow show where you had the eleven parts of the comprehensive plan, and one of them was the another one. And so we're thinking that all this is coming through in draft format, and we will be glad to have you back to go over it in more detail when it's finalized. Okay? Great. So we'll see you in the new year. Yes. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Anybody else have anything for free? If not, we thank you very much for coming, and I will give you back your uh, very nice speakerphone there because uh, it's very nice. <laughs> Well, yes. Eventually, if we had enough money, we would buy our own little nice kit for we don't. And so we, we make do with what we have. Okay. You have a, you have a system. You have a system going. Right, right, it works. Right. Yeah. Okay. So with that in mind, Okay, and you can if you could stand on the light side. Yeah, a little bit more closer to the that. All right, I think we can see you now and say something. And I'm going to ask people who are chatting, who are the participants, to tell me whether or not you can hear them. Okay. Hello, this is David Houston speaking. Can you hear David? Okay, uh, I don't see anybody hearing you. All right, so I'm going to ask that question in front. We're trying to see if you can hear David standing there. Can you hear David? Well, maybe I don't even have that as my speaker. Oh, we can hear him. It was just a little, um, a little muffled. So maybe if he could speak closer to the yeah, microphone. Yeah. As we go through our technical thing, you system. No, no, speak it, speak it, absolutely. Microphone. Okay. Oh, I'm good. I can see myself. David is muffled. So David needs to get closer because according to what Jim says, David is muffled. So don't stand there. Stay close. Okay. You get closer. I appreciate you doing that, Dave. So get closer and say something. We'll see if. If Jim is, if David is still muffled, see, there's a comment right over there. So come closer. Take this way, closer to that, because there's oh, a mic. This okay. is the mic. Okay. So, can you hear David now? Say something. Hello. Can you hear me? Is he still yes. muffled? Yes. We can hear him. Oh, I should have asked the question that answers yes or no, because you, the yes answer can mean both no and yes. All right. So, can you hear David? Yes, we can hear him. Fantastic. I mean, did you want this or that? And my answer is yes. You know, oh, that doesn't help me. All right. So, but I'm, so now I'm, I'm going to push your presentation. Okay. But I'm blocking it. So, no, no. You're these people here don't need to see it. It's the people on the computer who need to see it. So I'm. But they do. So stand to the move to your right. Uh, move away, right. No, uh, that way. My other right. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. Okay. okay. Good. All right, now let me pull up the presentation that you sent us, okay? Sure. And here is the special private presentation. Okay, hold on. I'm going to share my desktop. And I thank you, David, for uh, bearing with us as we can All right, share. That's not a share. And screen. You're learning from this, right? Follow. I'm following your lead. 
Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make this uh, full screen mode. Oh, I just did the opposite of it. I think I know what the new dot stood for, right? Well, and now I think it says, yeah, that support. There's another one that says full screen. Presentation mode. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's go. So, again, I'm David Houston. I'm an attorney with Bean, Penny, and Corman. Uh, nice to be back here again. And uh, with me tonight is John Alvarado in the back of the room, raising his hand with Costco, and also Phil Pryor of Collier's Engineering, who put together our PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'll just start briefly before we go through the slides. Uh, what we're here to do tonight is that there is an application pending a special exception amendment application to enlarge the existing Costco fuel facility at Chantilly Crossing Shopping Center. Uh, the gas station's actually pretty recent. It was opened in 2018. Uh, it opened with eight fuel islands, meaning 16 pumps. And what we're proposing to do is add three more fuel islands and six more pumps. So there would be a total of 22 pumps if this application were approved. Uh, the additional pumps would be uh, covered by an extension of the existing canopy. The pumps would be constructed in the area. And why don't we uh, advance a couple slides? Yeah, uh, one more. Uh, maybe one more. But what's on screen now? Let's go one more. It's zone C8. You're, you're seeing the entire Costco. Uh, we got to keep going. Sorry. Uh, all right. So this is the existing situation. And what you have are, uh, I, uh, four pumps in uh, four rows with two pumps deep. What we're proposing to do, and if you could advance, it's probably going to be two slides before you can see it. One more. Okay, this is what's proposed. Uh, the shaded area on the screen would be the extension of the canopy and the three new pump islands would be underneath the canopy. You might ask why we didn't do it across all four. It's because the underground storage tanks are under where we're not at, at, uh, increasing the number of pumps because they can't be covered. We need those. So, uh, so the the queuing, the the new pumps were going where cars currently queue. So people waiting in line, and hopefully all of you are Costco members and buy your gas here. Uh, you typically it takes about three minutes to pull up to the pump, fill, pay, and leave. Three three and a half minutes. Okay. So what happens now is if you're the next one in line in the current situation, you, you'll now be at a pump that you can start filling up. And so the efficiency of the, of the station improves with this without necessarily backing up the queue to wait any, any further. Uh, so what we're trying to do is increase in efficiency, reduce the queuing time for customers. Yes, sir. There's probably uh, if you would repeat his question since he's he asked it. how many cars currently queue in the line. I think it's in the forties. Uh, Phil, do you know offhand? Six, seven. I think we're only required five per. But it'd be seven so, times so you need eight. To repeat his okay. comments because he can't be heard by the people on the in the, in the, in the 
Uh, actually, if we go back, uh, Jeff, if you could go back to the aerial photo, which there. So this is the situation you have, and basically you have, I would say, room for five or six cars in each lane, of which there are eight. So they're building in front of or behind? In, in front of. So basically where it's shaded there, that's where the queue is. That's where the new pumps would go. So the new pumps are going back here. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, but not these two, but this area, right? Okay. So how many cars queue underneath the canopy at one time? How many cars can fill at one time? Uh, it's... Uh, Sorry. It's 16. No, right now, right now, per lane, per lane, right now, 16. Basically, you can fill two, two cars on each side. So, total four cars right now per lane. So, the idea is when we are saying the queuing, why don't you come so, up, John? Um, so, again, the other part of the cost. So, right now, right now, as you see, they, I mean, in this area, we have two pumps on, the, on right in the middle of these two ways, right? Perfect. So I can fill four cars one time. at one time. Our proposal is to put a third one in the back so I can fill three cars per lane. So what Debbie was saying is normally it takes three to three and a half minutes to fill one car. I have never been able to do that more than half a tank. I'm in line for a half a tank of gas for more. But it takes me almost five minutes to do it or six minutes to, to fill it up. So, okay. I mean, that's sort of, that's the, you know, the, the data that we have from. from oh, wait. Our... You have SUV. Oh. I, I can tell you, I sat. I got 16 gallon tank. So, I mean, I, I, I parked one day recently, like right here, and I watched the cars because I was timing them. I was, going to another meeting and killing time. And uh, I, I think it was closer to the three and a half, honestly. Uh, so that's, that's I, normally the data that, 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 that we do for typical, you know, typical I, I you know, But I'm okay, a, I mean. I have been asked, it's probably, I usually get it once a week, now I'm not driving. But yeah. I don't think I could ever get it from the time when I get into the pump position, shut the car off, do everything I have to do to get the car to, and, and get, get gas in and get the pump back and get back in my car. So okay. Less than five minutes. Okay. Yeah. When we when, when we say like three, three and a half, three minutes is basically pumping gas. So we are not talking like you know the whole process. But but, but I, I, I think the answer is, and you'll wait five minutes less now because you'll now have an opportunity. Now I'm waiting for two people to get done. That's no, but doing. the way that this is aligned you can pull in if two people are ahead of you or someone's in the first position and the third position you can actually pull right into this middle position pulling into the first position is just an easy backing into the slot pulling into the, the last position is easy just advancing you're well, now in the middle park. Park. Well, park in the middle of slot. Well, no, yeah, it's it's can't parallel uh, park for their life. It, it's actually they're spaced Far enough, I know line, you, you just know, pull in. Park. You don't need to parallel park. What they'll try to do is they'll try to pull in. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. I mean, let me, let me. So the that. pumps, the pumps right now yeah. are 20 feet three apart, yeah. right? So what you said correctly, if you just go around on like bullet lane, you can easy park in, in the start. Back into the slot. Yeah. So the next one that we're proposing, right, is the space. Further down, further up, that is going to be 28 feet, right? That I mean, we can show the turn route because I mean that basically came from from the gas department. Say like, okay, guys, when we're doing this, we need we need enough space, so you don't have to do any. I mean, All right, so what you're saying is it's more room, so you should be able. You to should be pulled over in front. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, I'll send you off. Yeah. Yes. Second nature. To I know. I live in New York for eight years in Queens, so I know what you're saying. Me, right? yeah. hey. So <laughs> then. There is another system that when we have a uh, gas, you know, gas stations that have three or more. So now we basically 
the new the new prototype is four by three or four by four. So meaning that it's going to be four deep, four wide in the new warehouses. When we expand, you know, when we have or in the new ones, when we have, you know, more than three pumps deep. Um, you see in the parking lots that you see a green bottle, a green light, or a red light. So we have that in the columns of the canopies. I show you, okay, the guy that is in the first pump or the person that is in the first pump left, so it's green, so you can go ahead, so you don't have to wait. So that's another um, measure that we take into move people quick. So bottom line or goal is to move people quicker through the queuing. And I mean, we've been doing this, I'm, I'm expanding like two, two dozen of this gas in the East Coast. And we have the data uh, and we have like now, it's not just we think it's gonna help out and, and, and help the problem of queuing. We know that it does it because I mean, we're in doing multiple, multiple gas. And uh, basically it's that just so we can put, move people quicker and alleviate the queuing that if you put gas in this, sometimes when it's busy and I mean, we get all, all the way up here. So that's, that's the, the bottom line of what we want to expand it. The mass is still around. Go over to the one in Fairfax. Yes. That is a total wreck. And we're working and to expand. We're expanding that. that. In there. Yeah. I, I just don't run Shanton. And those two are just the wreck. And, and what we have, what, what we see and what's happening with our, with our customers is that. So you go to a site and put gas and a nightmare because you see lines all the way, so like, I'm not putting gas. So we work through, I mean, to make the life of our members easier and better when they shop here, right? So that's what we spend this. So you don't see those lines and you can go and access the service instead of like, say, like you exactly say, Manassas is, is, is not that good. West Sox, that is perfect. And actually we're working on expanding those two as well for the same reason. We have a separate application pending for West Sox. West Sox. And we're doing exactly the same. And for Manassas, I mean, we're working towards that. We haven't submitted an application because that is a little bit, I mean, we're doing more stuff in that warehouse, but our goal is also to expand it. I suggest you check your nuggets. I'll, I'll go the time a person pulls up to the time they get back out of their car and get going again, meet you in that, if that car is in line, nobody can get gas for that car. Really? Really? And it's sitting in the squad. Okay. Now, we'll we'll finish by the time they pump. Oh, no, that's okay. Are you ready for questions? Are you ready to get to Oh, uh, we, uh, I mean, we can take questions. Oh, no. I think everybody knows where it is, understands what we're doing. Uh, we have a tentative planning commission uh, date of February 8th, and Emma Estes is our staff coordinator. Uh, we actually received staffing comments today, and they're pretty minor. Uh, and I can review those, but I'd like to hear from John. Okay. Um, I get the impression you're not expanding the imperial service at all. You're not just adding pumps. Actually, right. Okay. Secondly, uh, this comprehensive plan, uh, plan for this area has been redone two or three times over the last 20 years. And the main problem was stormwater runoff. Mm -hmm. Will this affect the storm? Water? So what's happening here is one, since the station is rather new, it was built at a time when the state stormwater requirements were much more stringent like they are currently. So it already has uh, uh, BMP facilities in place. We're proposing a jellyfish filter uh, to take the uh, runoff from the expanded canopy and take it away from the BMP facility. Hey, it's actually going to improve the same though, right? Technic actually, we're adding pervious surface by about 150 square feet. No, 27. 27? Uh, right, right here. One of our comments from staff. Yeah, yeah there's some existing uh, area right here that we're just bumping out and adding smaller to for some product piping. And you're also expanding this parking yeah. lot island. So with that new addition, we're actually adding green space. So if you look, this is an existing bioretention pond right up here. So it's already treating this area. And what we're doing is we're taking some area away for that. So we're over treating, we're going to treat this existing uh, canopy. 
Yeah, it should, it, it's not going to be adding anything. It's the so same. We're adding green space. Yeah. Here, a small amount. Look at the comments, the last two comments on the screen. If you would answer them, just for the sake of Yes, there's actually an existing pool of water separator. All of the, uh, everything that could potentially get any leaks from oil or uh, over pumping or anything like that drains to a little um, inlet, drop inlet, and there's a whole water separator which keeps the oils out. And there's a emergency hand pump that you can, they shut off if, if like a tanker were to spill, so they can actually close it off and store that in the, in the pipes on site. And, and Phil, I think there's a question. There is a regional stormwater pond. Right. And I think that this this Costco drains to that. So you can see the question on the lower right hand side? Yeah. So it's the petroleum stores. Costco maintains the oil and water separator. And uh, they have uh, one employee on site at all times, and th those employees are specifically trained for these uh, for gas station operations and what to do in the event of a spill or, or you know, and the like. So. Okay, the next question. Please look. There's never been a spill on the mountain. No. Never been a spill. No spills. And in fact, I mean, I mean, one of the benefits of Costco gasoline is it's it's still a hazardous substance, but it's uh, five times cleaner than the government standard for gasoline. They add, have additives to the petroleum they buy, so you're getting top tier gas, as they call it, if you buy from Costco. And just to make sure, this gas is only sold to Costco members. The gas facility is generally open the hours of the Costco warehouse. The gas usually stays open an hour later and, and opens a little earlier than the warehouse. Uh, there's no uh, Pylon signs, or there's signage on the canopy. There's no fuel price signs. You really have to go in to the warehouse to even find out what the cost of the gas is, uh, typically. Uh, but this is this is this is a service for Costco members that they are now expecting and demanding as part of their membership. I thought it. I thought it already opened. Um, Go on. Part part of when the gas station was originally approved, there was a proffer to put a signal at Penrose and Lee, and that Costco actually built that signal two years ago. I think it became operational two years ago. So that proffer was fulfilled. Uh, the Lidl uh, contributed $100,000 towards that cost. They did pay that. So I thought. But I don't know when it's opening. The one in McLean seems to be doing very well. Yeah, which slide do you want to be on? The Zoe fish? Or the uh, you know, uh, just let's keep advance to the next one. This this is the proposed jellyfish device, which is the the stormwater management that's being added to what's already out there. Uh, we do uh, the phosphorus removal has to be more than fifty percent in this area, and we're already above it. But this helps uh, keep it that way. You can keep advancing. Uh, Part of what the county comments have been is they would like Costco to explore putting in EV charging stations for their their customers. 
Uh, we're still actually talking to them about this. Uh, what we have shown here are they asked for six spaces of level two chargers. And what Costco has found is they would rather put in fewer spaces, but make them level three chargers. Does that do you all Le level three chargers are much faster and more efficient. And basically, if you use it, it'll probably fully charge your car by the time you shop and get back to the car. Whereas a level two charger uh, might fill it up a third or a half. So uh, Costco is looking to do fewer but higher quality chargers. And we're still in the process of talking to the county about that. It seems to me that when you are looking at this neck of the woods, I see a lot of electric vehicles. And I can foresee that in the future there will be many more of them. So I endorse them using level three charges, but I don't endorse them providing fewer because there's just going to be more EVs. Now, the other thing is, is that I want to see these EV charges with a credit card because I don't want everybody else who's using Costco to subsidize the very affluent people who could afford to buy the 65 grand That's on average right. yeah, EVs. Yeah. So there's no need to make them free that you see in many other places where they're gratis. And I go, they, they spend enough money in the car, they can afford the fuel. It's the old story. Nobody goes into a, a Rolls Royce dealership and says, what's the fuel mileage? The guy says, if you're buying a Rolls Royce, you can afford the fuel. Same thing here. If they're level three and they get charged, they should pay for it. I'm looking into an electric vehicle. I think I should pay for that as well. Thank we you. have found that it, at least on the East Coast, a lot of the EV chargers just don't get used. They'll put them in and they just. You, you will see, I, if I count the number of Teslas, because they're obvious, but there are more and more American cars that will be coming out that aren't as uniquely identifiable as electric vehicles. And I believe that you will see in the next two years, the tip has tip turned. We're no longer saying that it will be here. It has arrived. And what you'll see with Costco as a company, they're very attuned to what their customers tell them. And that's, they told them we want gas. If they tell them we want EV charging, they listen to those types of things. So I don't think adding more will be a problem if there's a demand for it. I'm just saying. And put it John, do you know if you all charge? So, I'm 100% sure on this, right? Um, because this demand of electric vehicles uh, or actual or gas department or bring a small department in the department for EV charging. And we have already deals with uh, um, a countrywide uh, EV charging manufacturer that we're working on. Uh, what uh, Phil was saying is in the East Coast, I'm sorry, in the West Coast, they get used regularly and more often. What we've seen the, in, the, in the East Coast and this Coast is we put it there and nobody uses it. Because normally what we've seen is if you have an electric vehicle, one, you're coming from your house or you're coming from work. And that's where you basically stay the longest. So that's where you charge your car. So when you get here, your car is already charged, right? But because we understand the requirements of how, you know, where, we, where the world is going, right? And we're having to provide what is required. So that's what we say, we're gonna put the level three chargers that if you have, you know, you need to like, I don't know, you spend half of your charge, get it to Costco, you can, I will okay. say that when I navigate from here to various places, I look where the Costco gas stations are. When I'm driving my EV, I will be looking for the same thing. And I will say, here's this Costco where I used to get gas. Can I fill my EV? Now that I've driven my 300, 250 miles, I need a charge. I'd rather go to Costco where I'm a member than buying it from Joe Blow's EV charging company. Exactly. And that I am. This part, what is, I mean, uh, um, we have to, I mean, have to dig more in it. And the next time that we see, I can explain that. If I know me second, it's going to be used for just or members, you know, no, anybody that can. Understand. So, same thing that I guess. Thank you.
Any other questions? Or let's go continue. All right. I think your screen is blocking the question. Oh, it's not a mic. There's a this one. Black, Black Friday sale. Now, Microsoft never happens on my Apple. Notice that. It only happens, never mind. But what this this slide is showing is uh, a change to the parking lot island that I mentioned earlier that's actually increasing the impervious surface. We are trying to increase the aisle width here so that cars that are looking to turn right won't be running into the cars looking to get into the gas station. And that was at the suggestion of the Department of Transportation and we've accommodated them with that. They've also asked us to look into some lane striping for the greater shopping center, which we don't own, but we're going to have to look into it. Um, like lane markings to show left turn lanes and right turn lanes and through lanes within the shopping center, the greater shopping center. That was a comment. Um, John, the chargers you have now, do you ever charge for them? EV chargers? No, I mean, I'm not you don't know. Yeah. My guess would be the answer is no, currently. But we will look into that. I believe the onus is on the purchaser to pay for his or her fuel, and nobody should get a free ride, especially since they can afford to buy that. Thank yeah, you. and these. These spaces are not located within the gas station. They're near the warehouse. And this is a rendering of what it would look like, which is hard for you all to see. And let's just keep going. I think we're almost done. Uh, the, the canopy will look like it looks today. And that's basically the signage on the canopy today. It will just extend out. Um, so, it's, you know, appearance wise, it looks very similar. So, for the future, you get a slide, make your picture bigger than the blue around it. Just technical speaking. <laughs> I don't see any more questions there, but here, anybody? This is sort of a summary. We're expanding the fuel facility at zone C8. We're really only disturbing 0.37 acres of the entire Costco parcel. We're implementing and installing a new stormwater management device. Uh, we're not impacting the underground tanks or any of the uh, buildings that are there. There's no change to the retail warehouse operation. This is solely a, a gas thing. Uh, we have uh, reduced the amount of surface runoff slightly. We will be adding EV charging stations and we're making those improvements to the dry aisle at the suggestion of staff. Yes, Mr. Litzenberg. Might want to look into by reducing the time you have to sit in line with your engine running, you will lower your carbon footprint. We are all about efficiency. No. So, like I said, we have a tentative planning commission date of February 8th. Uh, based upon the staff comments. We, we received today, uh, they, they feel they're very minor. I think uh, we'll probably be keeping that date. We have a couple weeks to. Fiddle with our plans and resubmit. If you would like us to come back. So I'm going to recommend that we have no objections to this. And I would recommend that unless the staff comes up with a proposition or a condition that you cannot address. We'll let that go and say that we have no problems with this. If, Wonderful. on the other hand, you and staff have a problem. Come back to us so that we can either hear out what the problem is and provide our 2 cents to the matter. Okay. Okay. With that. How many people here get gas in Costco? Okay. 
There's your answer. Okay. Make it ha as the what was the guy from the next generation? Uh, Star Trek. Make it so number two. <laughs> Or number one, right? Number one? Yeah. The card says make it so number one. We right? will do our best. All right, then there you go. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeff. Now the next people who are coming up, a team of all this stuff. You're gonna tag team, I assume. Um, I am a supporter. Okay. So what do you have here? Is this the presentation that we have, or is this a different one? Well, first, thank you for the Costco people to coming. My wife is patiently awaiting your wreaths and trees, but she refuses to do that before Thanksgiving. The turkey stays in his lane, Santa in his own, and last month the witches were out. So we don't want to confuse the matter. Okay, so you're going to give me this. Good night. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm sharing my desk, so I'm going to share this. All right, so this is your, which one of these am I looking at? Matt, it's uh, so forth from the bottom. Matt, Matt okay. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this to my desktop. Then I'm going to share this desktop. Okay. Okay, so file, save as. This PC and the name is twenty twenty two eleven twenty one. I don't need the band, but that's good enough. This this is redundant. Okay, so with that in mind, we've saved it. Now we're gonna open this up. Now I'm gonna share my desktop and screen PowerPoint. Here we go. Share. And now we're gonna go into slideshow, right? From the beginning. And, okay. And so I'm going to let you use the arrows to push it around. And I'm going to say, okay. You're sharing your desk. And again, if you would stand here, close enough to that, I think the people will hear you. And I will monitor the chat to see if there's any problems. Okay, introduce yourself. Go from here. Thank, thanks, Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Bob Brandt. I'm a land use attorney with the law firm of Walsh Colucci. And I represent the, uh, the Matt companies, which are the owner and the applicant in this pending rezoning application. Um, if, 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 if you believe my wife, I've got as loud a voice as any. So hopefully the people online won't have any issues uh, hearing, hearing me. So uh, let me know if you need me to speak up for whatever reason. But um, a little bit of background here before we get into the presentation. I actually worked with Matt and on this site a couple of years ago. Uh, we, we processed a rezoning application uh, on these properties or one of these one of these parcels that we're talking about a couple of years ago to allow a uh, development of about 144,000 square foot industrial building. Um, that building has been built. It was recently completed, and uh, what we're going through now is a rezoning process, really just to incorporate. Two adjacent parcels that Madden has acquired uh, in the in, in the last couple of years, and so um, there's going to be no changes to the to the approved building that was recently built. We'll have some slides and some images here to show you what those look like. Um, but really, what we're doing is incorporating a couple of different parcels into this approval. Uh, Melissa, are you going to be running through the? Do you, do you want me yeah, if you want to, if you want through, or Jeff, are you looking through? No, they're uh, okay. So I, I can't sure. Um, so anyway, I'm joined tonight by Melissa Mayhan, one of my colleagues with Walsh Colucci. Um, she'll be assisting with the uh, with the presentation tonight, and also by uh, Mick Risley with the Mac Companies, representing the owner and the applicant. So if we go to the next slide, Melissa. 
So this is uh, the property outlined in red, and I always like to start with a couple of slides just to give everybody some context. Uh, so it's actually a total of three different parcels. This is parcel number 10D, and that's the location, as you'll see in just a minute, of the recently completed industrial building that was uh, approved through a rezoning process two years ago and recently completed. The two additional parcels that we're talking about um, here are parcels 9A and 9B, and they are located just, to the, just a little bit to the west of Parcel 10D, where that where that building was built. Uh, parcel 10D, um, by virtue of the zoning uh, rezoning process we went through a couple of years ago, is currently zoned I-4. As you'll see here on the left side, the two other parcels that we're looking to incorporate now are zoned to the I-3 district. And so what we filed is a rezoning application on all three of the parcels, as well as a piece of the Barney Road right-of-way that we're asked to be vacated. We're requesting a unified I-4 zoning classification for all three of the parcels. All in all, it's about uh, 15 total acres of land. Go to the next slide, please, Melissa. This is just an aerial image uh, of what, what, what you just saw. Um, it's a little bit different now because uh, this property was previously wooded, but it's now developed with that 144,000 square foot industrial building. Parcels 9 and 9A, you can see here on the west side of the Barney Road right of way. Uh, are also similarly wooded. Uh, these parcels and most of the parcels in the surrounding area are currently planned and most of them are zoned industrial. Uh, this is an area of Fairfax County that's south of Dulles Airport, located just up here off the, off the, off the screen to the north. Loudoun County is here on the west. You'll see there's a number of industrial uses in the surrounding area. There's some contractor yards here to the west to the east of us. This is actually a VDOT facility. This is one of those giant salt pyramids. So, the character of the surrounding area is largely industrial. And um, one of the reasons that Fairfax County approved our, our application a couple of years ago is that it was consistent with the comprehensive plan recommendations for the site. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is an image, an aerial image of the of the approved building that was that was recently built. This is actually probably taken about, I don't know, Mick, if I had to guess maybe six or seven months ago when the site was still under construction. If you were to go out there today, you would see a beautiful, beautiful brand new building with surface parking and, and drive aisles around the uh, around the entire building. And so this is the building that was approved in 2021 uh, with the Board of Supervisors approval of the original rezoning. I think on the next slide, we've got a couple images. These are photographs that were taken pretty recently. Um, this is the brand new building. You can see the surface parking that's that surrounds it. Um, as part of the construction process, Matten actually constructed Thompson Road from the western terminus of the site all the way out to Stonecroft Boulevard. So that was one of the major benefits uh, that Matt provided with the construction of this building was a brand new section of Thompson Road there. And so the building, actually, they have a tenant lined up. I think, Mick, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, they take occupancy next week or within a couple of weeks. Uh, Laser Ship is going to be the tenant. They're going to be operating a distribution facility out of this building. And so I actually took an opportunity to drive by tonight. It had been a while since I was out there. Uh, and so it's a it's a brand new shining building ready for a new ready for a new tenant. Next slide, please. Uh, so why are we here? Why are we going through this process yet again? And the reason for that is that lasership and and users like lasership need a lot of parking. Um, they don't need a lot of parking for employees necessarily, and they certainly don't need a lot of parking for customers. But these warehouse and storage and distribution type uses need a lot of parking for trucks. Delivery vans, the types of vehicles that'll be that'll be servicing this site, and so uh, with the acquisition, Matt and recent acquisition of parcels 9A and 9B on the west side of the property here, it's provided an opportunity to provide a little bit more parking for those trucks, for those vans that'll be that'll be using the site. And so, um, what we have here on the right hand side, there are no changes, virtually no changes at all to the building that was built. Uh, when they went through with that, that construction process, there, were a storm, there was a large stormwater management facility constructed here on the northern part of the parcel. There was all of the, uh, the parking, all the required parking for, for uh, employees and staff. The Thompson Road was constructed, as I had mentioned, from Barney Road here all the way out to the east of Stonecroft Boulevard. Um, and so all of that is going to remain as it, as it is built today. There's no changes to that part of the building. What we are looking to do, though, is add a small parking area here on the west side of the existing building for those trucks, for those delivery fleets. Um, it's about, I think, about an acre in size. The 
uh, the two the two parcels combined are a total of about approximately six acres. And so, as you can see in this image, we're really only looking to use a very small portion of those new parcels. The reason for that is that a lot of this area, a lot of the parcels 9 and 9A, 9A and 9B, is located within what's called a resource protection area or an RPA. I'm certain that's something that the committee is familiar with having dealt with development over the, over the years. Um, but that RPA line is identified here with this hash green line around the perimeter of the site. And you can see here that we've been very careful, um, not only with the original approval, but also with the new, the new proposal here, stay outside the limits of that resource protection area. That's something that staff has very, very strongly consider, uh, encouraged us to do. And so we've been very mindful of that. And all of the, all of the disturbance, all of the new parking area is going to be located outside the boundaries of the RPA. One of the benefits that we're doing with this, and this is kind of a carryover for something that we did with the original rezoning, is that all of the area of the site that we are not disturbing, so everything that's outside the limits of our limits of disturbance, will be put into a conservation easement. Um, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of the area of the site is already constrained by floodplain resource protection area, but to the extent that there's any other otherwise developable area of the site, we will be placing that into a conservation easement to ensure that it remains undeveloped in perpetuity. So that I think is a major benefit. Um, but aside from this parking area, we, we, we've designed a couple of different options here. Uh, the option here that you see down here is fleet parking for delivery vans, smaller trucks, things of that nature. We've also designed an option to accommodate some larger vehicles, uh, semis, tractor trailers, larger trucks, and things like that, just in case Laser should need some additional flexibility there. Um, but again, it's confined to a relatively small area of the site. Um, in addition to the service parking area that we're adding, I mentioned earlier that there was a rather large stormwater facility here on the, the main part of the property. There will be a small dissension facility here on the new part of the site to detain the stormwater runoff generated by the additional impervious surface. We are also going to be putting stormwater quality controls in place as well to ensure that there aren't any, any water quality impacts. So Melissa, go to the next slide. Um, just to kind of quickly summarize, uh, once again, the property is currently split zoned I-3 and I-4. We're asking for a rezoning to the I-4 district, which is consistent with what the balance of the property, the 10 acres that we rezone in 2020 already is zoned. Uh, we are asking to vacate uh, that section of Barney Road <clears throat> that's not yet been built. It's dedicated right away. It's dedicated to the county back in the, I think it's the 1970s or 80s when the area was originally subdivided. It is highly unlikely that road will ever be built given the environmentally sensitive areas to the north and to the west of us. And so we've requested in Fairfax County in support of a vacation of that of that of that Barney Road right away. Uh, we are preserving the majority of the site, the vast majority of the site, undisturbing it or not disturbing it at all. And again, we'll be placing any areas that are potentially developable in the future into a conservation easement to ensure there's no encroachment of the rest of the property. And then finally, there's no modifications to the previously approved building. Um, it's ready to go for its new tenant, and we're very excited to have them here in Fairfax County in the Sully District. So the final slide we have, I think, is just kind of our next steps here. We do have a planning commission hearing scheduled tentatively for January 25th. Um, we actually recently received our most recent uh, uh, round of comments from staff a couple of weeks ago. We are we have very few issues to work for work through. I don't like to put words in people's mouths, but I am expecting a favorable staff recommendation moving forward. We're going to be resubmitting this, I think, in a couple of weeks, um, but we're, we're very confident we're going to be able to address the few remaining comments that staff had. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to open it up with any questions. We certainly appreciated uh, the committee's support of this the first time around uh, when we went through the rezoning process to, to get the building approved, and we're hoping to have the committee support again this evening. Any comments, please? Absolutely. Um, Please repeat his comment. No problem. The question was, will we put the conservation easement in writing? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, the one that was put in place already on parcel 10 B, so the, the, the eastern part of the parcel, that has already been recorded in the land records. Um, we will be including, we have already included a proffer language to require that same kind of commitment again. And so there will be a new conservation easement drafted and recorded for the areas uh, that, that we're now bringing into the site. Oh, my God. Perpetuity. 
forever. Um, quick, quick question for you, which you may ask for a feed on. Since you now have a defined tenant, the tenant identified what type of vehicle operations are going to be conducting? Is it going to be predominantly smaller vehicles, or are they going to have a significant number of tractor trailer semis operating out of this? Good question. So the question, I'll repeat it, is. Uh, now that we have a tenant identified, do we know exactly what types of vehicles, i.e. tractor trailers or smaller delivery vans, they'll be using? I think the answer is probably not yet, and I think that they'll want some flexibility to determine that as they move in. Um, the, the, building, the building is out there today. It's really just kind of a, a shell. They'll be coming in. They'll be making some modifications to the inside of the building and uh, making, it, making it ready for their needs. And so... Um, I, I think it might it would likely be a combination of both larger vehicles and smaller vehicles, but we are asking for some flexibility as the tenant moves into the space and kind of sorts out its own operations. Could you go back to the slide on the back of the streets? Uh, one more. One more. Okay, this one. Yep. So uh, go, go forward. And one more time. Okay, what are these two things that go into the conservation area? Oh, these things right here? Yes. Stormwater outfalls. So uh, under the, 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 the Fairfax County Zoning Ordinance and the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance, one of, the, one of the exceptions, one of the things that you are allowed to do inside of an RPA is construct stormwater infrastructure such as outfalls. So that's a great question, Jeff. The only thing and you'll see with the original approval, the only thing that we were allowed to do within the RPA there was construct a, a, a stormwater outfall. Similarly, that's the only thing that'll be in there today uh, in the future with this proposal. But as you can see, it's it's a very small, small area that'll be started. And this is dead run? Dead run. So you're doing this at a dead run. Okay. Correct. All right. Uh, the next question is for those of us transportation folks. Notice that this is Thompson Road, which currently ends at the east corner at Thompson Road. So that tells you sometime before the airport was built, Thompson Road came all the way out here. Because I can't see another Thompson Road that wasn't connected to the other Thompson Road. Would you thought about the Lewis? Well, no, I think it's a situation where if you go back, maybe close to 100 years and find a street map in Fairfax County so I much more comprehensive road system than you have today. That's reality in the history of that time. I just noticed that. And so you're saying the road here, Barney Road, is never built. No, and, and Melissa, if you want to go back a couple slides to the aerial, I should have mentioned this before, but this one's perfect. So correct, you'll see here that Barney Road uh, this is kind of the, the, the western terminus of, of Thompson Road that was constructed by Matt. This is approved right of way. It extends down to, I think it's Murdoch, south of here. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, Thompson Road was built and improved by Matt in, uh, in conjunction with the building. Uh, Barney Road is what we're asking to be vacated. And what you don't see on here that you did see two years ago when I presented this committee was Dolores Road, which previously extended, although it was never built, between Atkins to the north and Thompson to the south. When we went through that process, county staff was encouraging us to vacate Glorus Road. This is probably more history than the committee cares to know about. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you anyway. Um, at the time we were going through the process, we were we had reached out to some of these adjacent property owners because one of the things you, you need to do when you vacate right of way is get the consent of affected property owners, correct? And so we were uh, we started that process, but the county said, wait a minute, hang on a second. This one parcel here would have been landlocked had we vacated Glorus Road. And so Matton at the time of the original rezoning included a proffer that said, if and when the adjoining property owners are able to agree to vacate Glorus Road, you have to participate in that process, which is what ended up happening. The um, adjacent property owners, I don't know if you all worked with Git Hampshire, his client came through the process relatively recently with the rezoning up here. We worked with his client, we worked with this owner, the property owners agreed, and this stretch of Glorus Road, the previously dedicated right-of-way, 
was recently vacated, I'd say within the last year, year and a half or so. So what we're asking you to do is essentially the same thing that was done over here in Flores is vacate this previously dedicated, although unlikely to ever be improved, stretch of Barney Road. And Fairfax County has been very supportive of that request. Stone Cross Boulevard, how far do you want this to go before it becomes terminated at the airport? I, I think the airport's property line is, is right around here. This is this is the end of the road, so to speak. Um, I don't think it goes much. I wish we had an exhibit that was a little bit further zoomed out. Sorry, we don't. But, the perimeter road. Yeah, I think. Oh, is there a gate there, John? I think this might be Lamont's property right here. I'm oh, sorry, not Lamont's property. Uh, I think this might be the airport property right here. Yeah. So I think there's a gate somewhere around here, maybe a little bit further that, north. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. So there is a gate there. Thank you so much. Okay. So as we did in the previous Costco one. Is there any objection to what we're seeing tonight? Hearing none, we have no objection. If for some reason the county and you come to a problem where you need to resolve it and repeat it, we'll welcome you back. But otherwise, we'll go to Poe and say that we have no objection to what we presented tonight. Certainly. Okay. We'll keep you in the loop with our talks with the county. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, I, I like the fact that it's dead wrong. <laughs> and anyway, so when the, there's an oil spill at the airport, it obviously can't hurt dead wrong. <laughs> it's not the best name for a green. Is that? Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. Dead wrong. Right. Okay. Now you have this, on the I, other I, side, there's Kane Run. That's right. I'm looking for Able Run, but all right. <laughs> all right. Now the last one is. I'm also doing the last one. You're doing the double, double duty tonight. Okay, that's right. Washington Rice. That's right. That's right. So now I have Washington Rice yes. slide projection. Yes. All right. It's different from this one. So let me eject this. Get, okay. get it off and then we'll pull it up. So one uh, second, please. Guys, thank you all for your time. Thank you for thank coming you tonight. Now we'll go now. Okay. Have this charge is this charging? I know I need, I need to put a charger in here before this thing dies. Well, look at this. Oops, if you would plug that in, catch, we catch. It's charging. Okay. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't. Uh... Okay. This is ejected. We have your projected slide. Thank you. Okay. So the next thing is, let's go back to here and let's go back to the agenda. Okay. See the projected. Uh, I'm going to go to PDF. PDF. If there's any reason, PDF sounds fine. Okay. I think they're easier to work with for PowerPoints. Unless you have one of these embedded videos. Right. We don't have that. And the problem with embedded videos is I haven't figured out how to share the sound of the embedded video with people watching it on the screen. Yeah. They, they, they only see the mouth working. Somebody has, there's another way to do that, but I haven't gotten it yet. So hold on while this downloads the thing. Now, Washington Bryce is near the hospital. Correct. Okay. It's when we, as a Providence District Council in the 1980s, approved the hospital, we did not know it would grow like a cancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pun intended. Pun intended. Pun intended. Yeah. Okay. Because it did. I mean, if you look at it now, that is a. Uh, a very big thing, right? All right. So now the question is, am I sharing the screen? Let's go back here. Where, where is this? Share the screen. I'll hear you. And move this away. And presentation mode, right? Yeah. And you can see it here now. Let me make sure that on my computer, I see what's on the I don't. So I have to share this. So what's up here? Sharing Microsoft PowerPoint. See, I don't want to share my Microsoft PowerPoint. I want to share, stop sharing. Now I want to share something else. Okay. Now share Firefox 2. Share. 
share. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me look to make sure that I'm seeing it here. People are seeing it here. Okay. Please join. Fantastic. Thanks. So once again, my name is Eugene Bob Brandt, Walsh Pellucci. Uh, my colleague Melissa Mahan and I are working on this application. We have a new member of our cast of characters, Brian Thomas, who's our Brian, he's today. Yeah. Not, he can't. Please feel free to sign in. Uh, Brian, Brian's with Charles P. Johnson, is our civil engineer who worked with us on the project, and so. Um, we've got a brief, very brief presentation to share this evening on this, what I think is a very relatively straightforward resounding application, but uh, happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, so Jeff was correct. So if we go to the first slide here, um, this property is very close to Pharaoh's Hospital. Um, our property, our site here is, is outlined in red, and it's just to the east. This is actually the, a common property line. The, the hospital's property line roughly hugs the outer edge of these trees right here. Uh, but we, we we back right up to uh, to Pharaoh's Hospital. Uh, in addition to the hospital, uh, the surrounding area. This is West Ox Road that kind of runs north south through our screen. We are right on the edge of actually of the of the Sully District. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the 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 Springfield District begins right about here. So everything on the no, is that Springfield or the Providence? Springfield due to, due, to the re, due to the redistricting. That's correct. I had a client that was looking at some of the, some of the sites down here, and I was shocked to learn that it was not in the Selma District. But anyway, uh, so uh, in addition to the hospital, you got West Ox Road here, and then um, the, the surrounding area is predominantly residential, not much like a lot of the Selma District. Um, what you have here are are R three zone subdivisions to the north of us. These are the Westvale and the Westvale Woods subdivisions located a little bit to the north. These were communities that were built in the early two thousands. Uh, there were two different rezoning actions that 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 those two those, those two communities went through, and then uh, Pharaoh's Estates uh, here to the south and the southeast of us. So both of those communities are zoned R three. Uh, if we go to the next slide, a little bit of a closer in view, our site is is one acre, and it's a bit of an outline. If you look at the pattern of the development in the surrounding area, a lot of these uh, are R three zone lots are. Anywhere from 12, 13, 14,000 square feet thereabouts. Um, this one acre parcel stands out. And uh, the reason it stands out is at the time that Westvale and Westvale Woods, and that those are these communities here in the north of us, were constructed, um, this property owner at the time, not our client, our client's the current owner, but the property owner at the time was not interested in consolidation. Uh, Fairfax County and the comprehensive plan and county staff are always encouraging consolidation. And, for whatever reason, um, at the time, 20 some years ago, this property owner was not interested in consolidating. And so what you have here is a one acre lot surrounded in a sea of R3 zone land. Um, the property today is developed as a single family home that was built in the, in the 1980s. And it's accessed here via cul-de-sac on the Washington Bryce Road. You can see that there's a driveway connecting here uh, from the end of the cul-de-sac into the building. The site, however, is located also on the end of the cul-de-sac. This is called Rocky Meadow Court. And that's, you get there from, from West Ox Roads through the Westvale and the Westvale Woods subdivision. So it's kind of a uniquely situated site in that it's kind of located at the terminus of two, almost three cul-de-sacs. But uh, the surrounding area is predominantly residential. From a comprehensive planning standpoint, um, this site and most of the sites in the surrounding area of the surrounding neighborhoods are planned for densities between one to two dwelling units per acre, up to two to three if there's substantial consolidation. And so, um, again, from a, standard, from a planning standpoint, from a density standpoint, and a zoning standpoint, this R1 acre site is a little bit of an outlier today. Uh, the next slide, I think, is just a quick excerpt of the zoning map. Uh, I'll just quickly point out that this, this shading area that you see here in blue, this is all R3, 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 R3 up here, and then our R1 site sits like a, a hole in the middle of a donut, so to speak. So uh, what are we proposing to do here? Uh, our clients, the applicant, if we go to the next slide, we're proposing to rezone this one acre property from R1 to R3. That would be very consistent with the pattern of development in the surrounding area. Everything around it, as you just saw, is already zoned R3. What our client would like to do is um, remove the existing dwelling on the site and redevelop it with two single family dwellings. And so one will go away, two will be added, there will be a net increase of one dwelling unit. And so that two dwelling units on the one acre property results in a density of two dwelling units per acre, which 
as I mentioned, is consistent with the recommendations of the comprehensive plan. One of the things that will be required in order to do that is the extension of Rocky Meadow Court, that cul-de-sac to the north that was up on the screen just a little bit earlier. When that cul-de-sac was constructed, it was constructed short of VDOT standards. There's no curve, there's no gutter around the cul-de-sac. It was there was not quite enough site area there to accommodate a cul-de-sac that met VDOT standards. So it's substandard today. This redevelopment would result in the replacement of that existing cul-de-sac with a new one that meets all of their standards. And as you'll see in a, in a slide in a minute or two, um, that extension was always contemplated at the time that those other communities went through the rezoning process. Again, county staff had encouraged consolidation to the extent possible, wasn't possible, but those original rezonings that were done in the early 2000s ultimately did contemplate the extension of Rocky Meadow Court at such time as our parcel was developed. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this is an excerpt from those old zoning plans, actually. Um, I think this one was done in either 1999 or 2000. Our site is this rectangle here. You'll see it was not included. It was not included in the consolidation here. But uh, this exhibit was provided to show how Rocky Meadow Court, which is this full sack right here, would ultimately be extended down into our parcel at such time as, as, as it was redeveloped. And so it was always understood, it was always contemplated that this parcel would likely or could potentially redevelop in the future in accordance with the comprehensive plan. So those original rezonings did accommodate that extension. Go to the next slide, and this is an image that shows, hopefully, Death going on here. Okay. Well, if it doesn't show up on screen, share my screen. Okay. Can you see on your screen? Okay. Oh, there it is. We're coming through. You're there we are. You can see it's got a lot more data on it. That's right. That's right. Thanks to thanks to Brian's artwork here. Um, so this is this is what we're proposing to do with the site. So the footprint of the existing uh, dwellings on the site is roughly here, um, kind of in this location today. You can see the out. You can see the the yellow uh, driveway. And as you can see in this image, we're proposing, as I mentioned, to uh, build two new single family homes on the property. Um, we'll also, uh, as I said, uh, ex we'll be extending Rocky Meadow Court. It's currently uh, roughly up here today. It, it terminates before you get to our property line here. It'll be extended, it'll be widened, and it'll be improved with the redevelopment. We'll see here that we've added a sidewalk around Rocky Meadow Court uh, between the two dwellings, providing connection to the existing sidewalk which today only exists on this side. Um, I was actually walking down the street a little bit earlier this evening to check it out. There's no sidewalk on this side of Rocky Meadow Court. And so um, instead of building a sidewalk to nowhere on this side, we terminated it here at the driveway apron to this dwelling, but continued it around the eastern side of the of, of cul-de-sac. Um, the two homes are oriented, as I said, towards Rocky Meadow Court. We're proposing to do some plantings around um, the existing trees on the rear part of the site will need to be removed. We're preserving them to the maximum extent we can, but um, to the extent they'll be removed, we will be replacing them with landscaping throughout the site, as you can see on this rendering. In addition to the two dwellings, uh, we'll be complying as a, a court, as always, with applicable stormwater management regulations. There will be a new stormwater facility added here uh, between the two homes that'll be connected to existing manhole that's here on Washington Rice Road. Um, but there will be no more vehicular connection to Washington Price. Um, there is a nice pedestrian connection between the two cul-de-sacs that actually exists today. There's an asphalt path that you can walk to uh, to connect between the two cul-de-sacs. Those will be removed and will be replaced with a new sidewalk. Um, so again, it's a fairly straightforward rezoning application looking to go from one dwelling unit to two dwelling units. But again, it's consistent with the recommendations of the comprehensive plan. And it's consistent with the pattern of development that was always envisioned for this parcel dating back to the early 2000s. So just one final slide before we open it up to questions in terms of next steps and process. We're meeting with you all this evening. Uh, we are planning to resubmit to Fairfax County on the second. Uh, just received our latest round of comments very recently, similar to the last application, very minor comments. We're working through them right now. We actually had a quick call with staff at the end of last week. Uh, I'm anticipating that we'll be able to address virtually all of their comments. And we're hopeful to have their favorable recommendation. Um, but assuming that we're able to, excuse me, satisfactorily address everything, 
We have a hearing date and that will be scheduled for March the 29th. So, um, <coughs> plenty of time between now and then in the event we need to make changes, work through some things with staff. But um, I'm confident that we'll be able to do so hopefully with this next round of submissions. So, uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you all for questions, comments, concerns. Uh, let me see if there's any uh, chat folks we have. Well, while you, while you, why don't you go through that? Would you like to go back to the plan? Uh, yeah, sure. The, this is the, uh, where you showed the two houses yep. right there. The neighbors right behind looks like those houses dwarf those. If you had any complaints from them. We actually, good question. We actually met with uh representatives from all three of the surrounding hoas we had a call with them a virtual meeting with them last week i know that there were uh, at least a couple of the adjacent property owners who attended that meeting it's very positive discussion i had to say on the bottom uh, they're very small compared to the ones you're did they have any complaints it, not necessarily no uh the reason i mentioned that you yep. can fix that if they do a screen so, correct. And I, I think there is going to be a good amount of screening here on the back side of the site. There's a number of trees along the southern property line that are there today. Okay. Those are going to be preserved. Okay. Um, but we have we have reached out to all of those communities, and as I said, we, we began the dialogue last week. Okay. Yeah. Screening. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, I have a few. Sure. Uh, in my Wanderings around the hospital while my wife was getting PT. I would walk down Washington Bryce to the other one and cross that little path that you talked about. Yep. That path is steep. It is. And currently, you go back to the slide that shows the path. So we go to yeah, come right here. Uh, a little one more, because it's you really don't okay. okay. One more, you said that there was a lab. All right. So there is a walkway here. Okay. Now that walkway, as it was mentioned, was asphalt. There's a height difference between the street to going to the north right. and Washington Bryce. The pedestrian path or the bicyclist, as the case may be, going down finds that the path doesn't go to the curb. You have to make a dog leg. At a, a pedestrian has no problem with that. Right. A bicyclist going down has to make an immediate right and immediate, immediate left and immediate right to get there. Otherwise, he or she bounces over the curb and hopes for good luck. <laughs> so I'm asking you that when you build that path, mm -hmm. that you take into account that make it easier for a bicyclist. Because there were bicyclists going between these two sites because there's a way to get from a good portion of West Ox south of West Ox without going through West Ox by going through these communities. Yep. And so make it easier for the community bicyclists and pedestrians to get to point A to point B. If I'm not mistaken, there's also a path that goes right from my stomach going north. Correct. That's correct. And this is this is common area that's owned by the Fair Oaks State HOA. Yeah. And so I think you're right. I think I saw that there was a patent. It, it may go all the way out the west. It does. I'm not sure. I have, okay. I have used it. I, I didn't walk that. I didn't like to walk that. That could put that part yet. But I walked this path that you're describing as well. And I thought the same thing. It's interesting. There's, there's fences on either side of that today. There's a fence along this along this home right here and a fence along this home. So it's a little bit like a cattle shoot, if you will, exactly. as you go down that hill. Okay. So I'm asking you for the pedestrian and the bicyclist to sure. turn back. We'll look Don't at just that. leave it the way it is. We'll look at that. The last question is there's also a path from the hospital to this community. Mm -hmm. It's a dirt path that the people who live here and commute to the hospital have forced on the soil. It doesn't exist on any trail mm -hmm. but if you have strava strava the, the tool that you use to hike and things you see that many people use mm -hmm. and i'm certain that there are many people in this community who work at the hospital who prefer not to drive there and just walk through the woods to get where they're going uh, i think that entrance point is further to the south but it connects into the washington bryce pedestrian access points and I don't know whether or not it gets up as far as to where this site is. Mm -hmm. 
Do we have a set of situation? No objection. If you want to scout the answer problem. Okay. With that in mind, we don't hope to see you back. But if you need to come back, we will welcome you. Nice. All right. You're welcome back anytime. You're welcome back But we don't need to take it first. I think this is the problem. Okay. Great. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for your participation today. We thank you for coming out and being with us today. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Great Thanksgiving day. Thank you. Now, all. before I let you go, let me point out a couple of things that are happening for us. And I'm going to get on the website. And first, I'm going to escape from this. And I'm going to share. Not this, but this, okay? Okay, hold on, you're sharing Firefox, okay. And so I theoretically can close that. All right, so I think, I, I think I'm think i sharing this. Jim, am I sharing this? Jim, I'm you to people. All right, but let me point out something. Oh, business. Uh, uh, Jim Nabe has noticed that the, the Fairfax County Water Facility at Willard Road is installed, the construction is installed, right? Uh, there have, if remember, we heard about the SSPA nominations, and Jim took a look at these, and he thought there are three of them that might be of interest: townhouses on Route 29, uh, next to Clifton Road, six-story apartments on Route 50, and mixed use. We'll look into this to see if we can invite them to partake. Uh, here's some general interest items and some meetings. You can have a virtual town hall on next Monday for a week from today. And that's with our delegate Irene Shin, Ken Plum, Rip Sullivan, Boisco, and George Barker. George Barker now covers most of Sullivan. But before, many of us might have been in Jennifer Boisco or somebody else. Barker, who used to be more south in Fairfax, is now further north. That's the day He's around, but he's not us. In fact, late last week and the week before, I got a mailing from George Walker, and I go, why the heck did I get that? And after further consultation, he is our state senator. Oh, will be after the elections come this one when he runs. He's going to be running to service the people of Franklin Park, Northern State. Are there new maps that illustrate where those precincts Oh, yeah, you can go find those. Those maps are at all. Well, find them in one thing. I'm saying is anybody publicizing these maps. I have seen them before. I will create a link to the next agenda. Okay. Uh, and Prince William County Department of Transportation, and this is courtesy of Lewis, has a Route 28 public hearing on December 13th. Talking about their improvements to Route 28 in their county, which of course is packed up. Now, if you find the original announcement and click on the link, somebody typed in Route 26 instead of 28. I have created a link that works. Okay? Because Route 26 might be somewhere else, but there's no website. But Route 28 works. I can't speak to you. Okay? All right. So, right now, we have no land use cases for December. Today is the 21st. So it would have been the 19th of December if we had a meeting. There may be meetings coming up. Right now, we have nothing on the agenda. We have for our regular meeting on Wednesday, the 21st, the Fairfax Federation will be coming to present what it does, why it is, why, what the fact that we're members, affiliate members. Lewis is our representative for the Fairfax County Federation Board. All right. With any other questions with that, it's Five to nine. We went through four things tonight. I thought everything did well. See if the next thing the email from Jim Hart about Mary Fourteen. Yes, in fact, there was a link to hold on, here we go, here we go, here we go. I had put Mary Katina provided this handbook and structural BMP specifications, right? But uh, so that's I think what we're talking about. The thing that he said is this, his Costco application is only about four years old or five years old because the state has not changed the requirements as of yet, and they need all current. Oh, okay. okay, so I'm pretty sure that's what he was talking about, is that they're current, they're like, there are gas stations that have been grandfathered from decades ago, 
he is as current as you can be because it hasn't changed since that time. Right. And that's Massachusetts. Yeah, he was. And he some of those questions that you saw before that were asked were Jim's questions. There you go. Okay. With that in mind, folks, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming. And have a great Thanksgiving. And since my kids, my daughter from Minnesota, are doctors and they work every other month year for Thanksgiving, we had Thanksgiving last weekend. Oh. Because they can make it the week before Thanksgiving. This year they work Thanksgiving. The next year will be vice versa. So oh, see, I, my Darian made turkey soup today. That was the third day of turkey. We had turkey. And we had three pies. We're down at the bitter ends of the pies. Oh, yeah. Oh, ah. I've had to lay out a mess. You didn't have to. My wife went to the grocery store today. And all sold out of turkeys. And uh, yes, yes, we he could find the giant. I turned it down by the Not right my teacher on the board of district when I have a lot of I'll contact it go But it's funny because I have been on that trail as I mentioned as I walked from that to a place and yeah, he's about I walk there and have an hour to do your peaking here. I find this, I look to see where it gets point in. I try to get from one subdivision to another. And from the northern one, you can walk down and just say, uh, an easement to a lake or, or a pond. I could not get that to the next street. street. I saw the street. I was Why is it? You know, I was like Briar Rabbit. It was just getting worse and worse now. You know, the bush, I was getting on his step. That was a little 70s. Well, I had to walk through the thing. It's just killing me. It's not all the puzzle. It's probably not up. Uh, well, the two story of all the cars. You the other side of the street was the main street, and I can walk through the I was carrying my luggage about a shuttle bus. I saw the rain that's going by. I saw the New York and the rain was And my double deck outfit was being shredded. So, what I did is I took my jacket, put my luggage down, walked to the house. I locked it with well and jeans and then went back to get my luggage. And I realized that I put my luggage on this reverse side of the swell, which meant I couldn't see my luggage. It was hidden from where I was, and it was just a race. I had contact with my dad, I went home, and my wife says, Hold on, call my wife. She said, Oh, I'm home, bro. I said, I'll leave to work early. He said, No, don't work early. No, I'm just you were because I was definitely trying to find luggage. It's true. My wife dropped it. I didn't want my wife to hold it. And then I had to explain to her. I had to look at seats on the bus right back. That's when my husband was going to get back. Oh, yeah, you started. Yeah, the way I was thinking, it's still embarrassing for me to say that I lost my luggage and I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to be there. It was, it, was, it was just it was much easier to walk you than I was coming on there. Oh, I did. Going to the back, and then it was two miles and of the street. Right. But that was on the hard part. It's just better talking about it. I thought you were saying it's an easy They all want to say it. It's not for the last. They're about George Barber on some ways. I was in 6 a.m. got me back. Well, George Barber, who used to be chair of the Transportation Rights Commission, was a former citizen yeah. of the uh, and he had ran the grand uh, He had a talk with people in British Columbia, and he had a talk with people in British Columbia, which was very southwest of Fairfax, and Fairfax, Florida. And he's in line with Janet Powell, who is going up with the entire industry. Okay. 
George Barber yeah. is in line and he tried to chair it over and it's in the It was back to the finest thing still on my way. <laughs> we don't know. He never announced that he was going to go up five blocks from five blocks from the Dallas Park. I do not. He lived in a general close to the United States and whatever. Comparing to Fairfax, but I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for the East of the United States. I wanted to find out what he did for so you are on the you can make a word on Yes, you can All right, so first off, kill. Well, kill. There you go. The market one plug out, one plug out. So when you were young.